Today I want to preach from this subject, conquering the world. Conquering the world. Father, bless us as we minister the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In our quest to defend, promote, discover, submit to, obey, proclaim, walk in, to become one with and to know God's truth. We have been preaching and teaching about the world. Why the world? The main reason is because of some things that Jesus said about the world uh, during his priestly prayer from which we get our theme for 2020. As you know, the theme that God has given us is just simply this, God's truth. It's not the year of God's truth, but God's truth. We're making a proclamation. We're making a declaration. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 17, and verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word, the Bible, is truth. In this prayer, our Lord said this concerning the disciples in verse 9 of John's Gospel, chapter 17. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all thine are mine, and thine, all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. He said in verse 13, and now I come to thee, and these things I spake in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus even said, I pray, verse 15, I pray not, that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Finally, in verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So our Lord had a lot to say about the world. That he's not of the world, but that the world would hate believers. And yet he says, I'm not going to take them out of the world. We're, we're given a mission here in the world. The world that our Lord was speaking of, he wasn't speaking uh, concerning the planet as much as the world system things that are going on in this world. And we're here. And we're going to be here until Jesus come or until death come. So we've been talking about the world. The world, the cosmos. The two words that we've elevated dealing with world is cosmos, two Greek words, and eon. We know that there is the tabel which deals with the world, i.e. the planet. And then the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word for earth is emeps and uh, erets, excuse me, and that is the planet. We're not talking about the planet. We're talking about 
the cosmos, the eon, that non-specific term for humanity in general, the sum total of the material universe and every living person in it, the world. The world, that is the age, the eon, which has to do with the current age or what may be in vogue at the present time, whatever is in style right now. The world described by MacArthur, you've heard this, but he called it a floating mass that is something that is ever-changing, a floating mass of thoughts, opinions, maxims, speculations, hopes, impulses, aims, aspirations at any time current in the world, which may be impossible to seize and accurately define, but which constitutes a most real and effective power being the moral or immoral atmosphere which at every moment of our lives we inhale and again inevitably exhale. The world, the world, the world, the eon as seen and we see it in certain crazes that break out. Fads, trends, any form of collective behaviors that develop within a culture. I'm talking about the world. That develop within a culture or a generation or a social group which is enthusiastically followed for a finite period. The world. It constantly changes. We're in right now a yoga craze. We've been in the diet craze for years. You know, they have more weight loss plans and more diet plans uh, in the world today than ever, and yet there are more obese people. The world. There's a fitness craze. You who are a little older, you remember the Tabo craze, Zumba craze. One time in every commercial, they were pushing things hypoallergenic. You didn't even know what it meant, but every other commercial, this is a hypoallergenic oil, hypoallergenic this and that and the other. These, they're crazes, and these crazes aren't evil in and of themselves. Remember, the world is moral and immoral, but they are crazes nonetheless. I want to show you how the world works. It's a gluten-free craze, a vegan craze. People act like they are uh, morally superior when they say, I'm a vegan. <laughs> and, you know, they've gone all the way when they call themselves a vegetarian. These are Crazes. Yeah, yes. I didn't call them crazies, but craze. Um, we've lived through those who are a little older, because my, a lot of you young people may not know this, uh, but uh, that was not always a global warming craze. It used to be global cooling. That's why y'all not to fall for it. Back in the 70s, they said, by now, everything would be frozen over. Well, that's, what, that's why I came up hearing, the, the, the planet is freezing. And then, then there was the global warming craze. And a few years ago, every time they had to try to have a global warming convention in a certain city in the U.S. during that winter, uh, it got snowed out. Some explorers, it really happened. Some explorers went to the North Pole 
to prove that the earth, the ice caps were melting. And they had to send helicopters to come up there and get them because they like to froze to death. So they came up with a term that means nothing, um, uh, but, uh, but it, 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 you can't get it wrong when you use this term, and that the term is climate change. That's a nonsensical term because the, the thing about climate is, the nature of the climate is that it changes. So these are crazies. These things are designed to get your attention. These are things that people began to fall for or take part in. This is the world. You remember the Mohawk craze? You had grown men with little boy haircuts. This one just went out, the dying the top of your hair craze. Brothers with, and sisters, blondes, I don't know what you called it. Uh, the, uh, the football player, the Odell, I guess it's the Odell look. And all of a sudden, all over the country, the little craze broke out. There's a tattoo craze out now. Even though the Bible says thou shalt put no markings on your body of the living or the dead. And if you've already, you already have some, just don't put any more on there. Um, there is the, I don't know what, ladies, now some are going to walk out on me now. But I'm, I'm a guy, okay, I'm a fella. I've been a fella all my life. I, I, was, a little, I was a baby one time. I went from being a little baby, a baby boy to a boy, from a boy to a young man, from a young man to a grown man. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to let you in on something with men. Men don't like with your hair all shaved on the side, looking like a sergeant in the army. Y'all watch that. That's, that's a little serious. That's a little too hard. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Amen. That's, that's not, that's not, lead the crew cut to the guys. Amen, amen. Just, but these are, these are, they're not wrong in and of themselves, but they're crazies. And the, some are because Paul declared that the sexes should be distinguished in their appearance. Amen. That's Bible. Men, um, there's a craze of men with uh, earrings. The grill craze. People losing their teeth, putting them things in. So you, you, you ought to know that it don't belong in your mouth if you can buy it at the local <laughs> Hair, hair styling. Huh? Beauty supply store. See, y'all not, not to put it in your mouth if you can buy it at the beauty supply store. That's a sign that you shouldn't have that in your mouth. Amen. But it's a, it's a craze. The sagging pants. I'm surprised that that one has lasted as long as it has. Um, um, and conversely, there have also been religious and social crazes. This is the world, the creatives. Young people, you know what I'm talking about. The woke craze, the super apostles, the super prophets. The spoken word, you remember that? Uh, the five-fold ministry craze, even though it's in the Bible, it became a craze, a thing. People's almost judging your church. Do you have the five-fold ministry? Well, we just believe that the whole Bible, you know, that, that wasn't what they were looking for. Um, various things. There is the now the one-hour church service. 
craze, the dress down Sundays, the leisure look craze. You know, one time they had that craze where when the preachers were preaching, I asked you not to do it and you were so kind not to. And every now and again, a visitor who didn't know would and we didn't say anything. But you remember the little craze that was going on where people was lie, laying money on the altar while the preacher was preaching. I guess when you preach something they agree with, they go and put a dollar on the offering. Kind of remind me of a pole dancing or something. You know? <laughs> Girl on the pole in the club, if they, if they like it, you spinning right, they put, put a dollar in the... Thank God that that one is gone. And as I said, many of these, and some of it's designed to make you laugh, and I know that some of you have no sense of humor, but uh, many of these craze uh, and fads aren't wrong in and of themselves. Some of them were, but the danger is that when you combine all these, and if you are a ministry or a church or a person trying to keep up with all of these, they rob you of your consistency. They rob a ministry of its identity. And when you have no identity, you have no light. You have no brand. This is why the Apostle Paul said to the Saints in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, he says, and be not conformed to this world. The word conformed refers to an outward expression that does not reflect what is within. Often people say, don't look at me and judge me because you don't know my heart. And that is such a true statement. You don't know people's heart. But one thing I would re recommend, that if you have a good heart, you ought to look like you have a good heart. I, I don't want to have a good heart, but look like a gangster. Because somebody may uh, mistake me. You don't hear me. Remember, Paul was warning against the word be not conformed literally carries the idea of masquerading. He was saying to the believer, do not pretend, do not look on the outside like what you are not on the inside. The temptation was great to do that because in those times there was great persecution in the Roman Empire for Christians who looked like Christians. So many of the Christians would try not to look like Christians so as to avoid persecution. So they conformed. They conformed to whatever was popular at the time. So as not, so as to fit in. Not everybody had the courage of their conviction. Praise the Lord. The thing I love about my college years, college students, uh, at Fayetteville State, I played football there. I was saved on campus and a preacher on campus. And I learned that the way that you stay saved on campus is you got to be who you are. I was not ashamed of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I worked my way up to a starting position on the team, but I didn't do it at the expense of my walk with God. I found out that you could uh, uh, matriculate through a college campus, do well on campus, and still be saved. Amen. And not have to deny, praise the Lord, your walk with God. See, when we, we begin to masquerade and begin to conform, it carries the idea of being transitory, of being impermanent and unstable. 
I love what J.B. Phillips said about this, and I'm going to preach to you in just a moment. He said, we are not to masquerade as a worldly person. You know, now it's popular for Christians uh, to look, we're almost Christian, we're, we're worldly people in our appearance. We're Christians in disguise. Disguised as being non-Christians. Disguised as looking like we don't belong to Christ. And then we try to spring it on somebody a little later on and say, you know what, I'm born again. The truth is, the way you let your light shine is that you be on the outside who you are on the inside. Amen. Uh, Philip said, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. That's something to think about. We must not pattern ourselves or allow ourselves to be patterned after the spirit of this age. We live in an age where people now believe that there are more than two genders. Despite the evidence, God made them male and God made them female. Look at what is popular in this age. Oh my, there's over 2,000 different religions in America in this age. We cannot allow ourselves... To be patterned after the spirit of the age, we must not become victims of this world. We are to stop allowing ourselves to be fashioned after the present evil age in which we live. You know, young people, to be strong in this world and to be successful, you got to, you got to develop a tough outer core. Tough skin, a strong mind, a strong belief system. You got to believe God and be willing, and not just the youth, to stand alone. Because we're living in a world now where, by and large, people are weak. People go along to get along. Everybody want to fit in. Everybody want to be liked. Everybody want to be accepted. The only thing about that, that liked crowd, that accepted crowd, the Bible says that broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go that way. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth to life. Can I get a witness? Then Jesus says, few there be that go therein. What is my point? My point is, our opponent is the world. This, this ever-shifting age, which is attractive, which harbors fun and thrills and things that you want to be a part of, but it's designed to destroy you. It's designed to separate you from the Lord Jesus Christ and your God-given destiny. It's the world. So John writes... And he says to the saints in our text, he uses a term of endearment. He calls the recipients of his letter, dear friends. Amen. He's speaking of Christians united with God and then united with others through the bonds of peace and their love that they have for the Lord. He calls them beloved. He said, beloved, believe not every." Spirit, praise the Lord, and and this particular passage, if you, it, it really mirrors um, chapter two, verse eighteen through twenty-seven. I won't read it all, but he says in verse eighteen, little children, in chapter two, little children, this is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. This is how we know that this is the last time. So that, that tells me that the Antichrist has been in the earth. Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, has been in the earth at least since 90 A.D. For in A.D. 90, John wrote this letter. And he says, you've heard that Antichrist 
shall come. He says, I'll tell you that there are many antichrists already in the world. This is how we know that it is the last time. And then he speaks of some people who departed, some defectors, those who left the church. He said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, you see that? They would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. These defectors that left the church, John said they left because they were not of us. They were listening to false teachers. And John said to them in verse 20, but you have an unction, glory to God. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. You know that the people in verse 19, even though they claimed a special anointing, they claimed to know something that you did not know. He said to his, the recipients of his letter, you know what you need to know. One of, the, one of the tricks that Satan uses to fool people is to get people to think that by serving the Lord, life is somehow holding out on you. That by serving Jesus, you're somehow losing out on some things that you should be involved in. So you look at the world and you see young people and you, you hear their talk and you see uh, the, the, the television shows and you hear the music and you, the de it's designed to make you feel that you're missing out. I thank God that I have an anointing. And because of my anointing from the Lord, I know what I need to know. And what I don't know, if it's something that I need to know, God will make sure I come to know it. Are you praying for me? He said to them, believe not every spirit. Hear me now, and those who are streaming. And I thank God for our streaming audience. I heard the other day while streaming and while doing a broadcast, uh, we had technical difficulty. And I'm grateful that I'm going to give a shout out and call certain names uh, at another time. But just a sheer number of people from around the country who called in or, 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 or emailed or, or sent letters in saying, where's, where's the ministry? I need my fix. I watched it. This is my church. I, I listen to the word every Sunday. I wait for this before I go to the church that I attend, people from other areas who can't, who can't get here. That, let me tell you, there's a market for God's truth. People want to know what the Bible says. Not everybody has turned a deaf ear. There are people who appreciate the truth being preached with power and authority. John said, believe not every spirit. Spirit, the Greek word is pneuma. The word spirit, he's not speaking of spirit as in ghost. Spirit as in ghost, but he's talking about a spirit as in doctrine. Doctrine, teaching, ideology. He says, believe not every doctrine, false doctrine. One definition of spirit is current or breeze. But what he's talking about here, he says, believe not every thought that come to your mind. You know, when you're preaching, there are, you can tell when you're preaching, when you're preaching to people who are open and are receiving. And you can tell in the same congregation, those who are tense and are fighting, who resist. And one of the worst things that you can do is to resist God's truth. Because if you resist one day too many, then the Lord won't send his truth to you anymore. And then once that happens, you won't be saved. Amen. That's in the Bible. God says, you know, I swore in my wrath. They're not going to enter into my rest. I tried them. I tested them. I gave them plenty of time. God's, the Lord said, I come to the conclusion, this is a people that do error in their heart. They ain't going to do right. So I'm going to kill them in this 
wilderness. Be careful how you hear God's truth. You know, I said the other day, the parable of the sower is not about the seed. <clears throat> we put emphasis on the seed, <clears throat> but the seed in the parable of the sower stays the same. The emphasis is upon the ground. The ground represents the individual. What kind of person are you? As I sow the seeds of the gospel to you, are you stony ground? Are you thorny ground? What kind of ground? Are you rocky ground? Or are you good ground? If you're good ground, the word will grow and will germinate. And will come forth. But if you're filled with thorns, oh, you're not going to receive it. If you're filled with stones and rocks, your heart is too hard. Oh, my. If you, and if, and if, you, if you represent the wayside, then you've missed it all together. It all depends on the individual. Glory to God. Hear this. He says, believe not every spirit. And in our text, John strikes a blow at two false doctrines. One was the false teachings of antinomianism. The antinomians believe that we are saved by grace and human performance is not required at all. That means once you get saved, you don't have to change. You don't have to get right. You don't have to get sanctified. You don't have to give up anything. If you were drinking before you met Jesus, you can keep drinking, and you're still saved. Cussing before you meet, met Jesus, you can get, meet Jesus and still be a cusser, a liar, so forth and so You don't have to get any better. Anti means against. Norms means rules or laws. Antinomianism. So that was a doctrine that John was attacking when he wrote this letter. And the other was the doctrine of perfectionism. Where it says, and it teaches the belief that the sin nature, once we get saved, have been cut out of man so that he has no sin at all, not even a desire to sin. That's why John said if we say we have no sin or we have not sinned, we make him a liar. See, even after you get saved, the sin nature has not been cut out of you. Even after coming to Christ, we still desire to sin. We grapple with sin. Am I right about it? So these are two opposing doctrines. For one doctrine taught you don't have to grapple at all and you're as saved as you want to be. The other doctrine to the other extent taught that you, if you're really saved, if you're truly saved, if you're really saved, and you're really, 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 really saved, then you don't want to sin at all. And I've heard people get up and say, you know, when you really get saved, you won't want the world, you won't want sin, you won't want to do any of that stuff. And every time I would hear it, I'd be sitting there thinking to myself, well, Lord, what's wrong with me? Because a whole lot of that stuff I want. Praise the Lord, I want. And, and, and then I learned that this is what we grapple with. Praise the Lord. Oh, I know some of you, you're walking in perfectionism. Or you want people to believe that. But everybody has to contend with sin. John said, believe not every thought. Don't you believe everything that comes to your mind. Don't you believe every doctrine you hear. Praise the Lord. On the campuses of learning, in the campus of life, where you work, on the internet, there's all, there are all kinds of doctrines and teachings and crazy stuff out there now. Be careful that you not get caught up in that stuff. It's designed to pull you away from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. John said, beloved, believe not every spirit, but test, try the spirits. Try the spirits. Now, let me help you. The Bible does not say Try the spirit by the spirit. That is a nonsensical uh, comment, and it's not true. That's not written in the Bible. Anywhere. The Bible teaches us how to test doctrines. Praise the Lord. You need something to test, to uh, compare what you're learning 
to. See, if you don't have anything to compare it to, you're sitting duck. That's why when you come to church, you ought to pay attention. That's this why in churches, we ought to teach folk. And, uh, and if they're willing to learn and listen, teach them. Because in the world, you're going to be exposed to many things. You're going to be exposed to many doctrines, many ideologies. I've said for years that the Oprah show, Dr. Phil, Ellen, uh, most of these law shows, they're good entertainment. And if you enjoy watching them, that's fine. But know that they're not entertainment only. These shows promote a doctrine. They promote solutions to life without Christ. They, they promote solutions to marital problems without Christ. They promote, sol they promote solutions to problems minus the cross. And they're on all day long. And if you don't know Jesus and you don't know the Bible and you don't have a foundation, it's so easy to get pulled away and caught up in these things and not to even recognize the devil. How he said he warns us, beloved, uh, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Test these doctrines and thoughts and things that are being said to you. Try them to see if they've come from God. And why does he warn this? Warn them. He says, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. That is, that is upper room, many false prophets from our church. He was saying, many preachers, notice what he says, gone out into the world. That is going out from our congregation. People have left. He says you've left the church that John was the pastor of. You've gone out and began to preach things contrary to what you learned at the church. You were in the church but you let spirits you let doctrines you let thoughts you let the antinomians, you let the perfectionists, you let the false teachers get in your head. And you left the church. And once you left the church, you began to preach doctrines and things that were antithetical and contrary to what you learned in the church. That's what he's saying here. So he says now, you got to guard yourself. Guard yourself because there are doctrines, there are teachings, there are things. Oh my. So he says now, here's how you protect yourself. He doesn't say something as nonsensical as try the spirits by the spirits, but he says, hereby, verse 2, here's how you know the Spirit of God. Here's how you know whether or not you're listening to a false teacher. Can I get a witness? Or a true preacher. A good doctrine or a bad one. You know what you weigh it against? What they say about Jesus. What they say about Christ. Where is Christ? I've, I've said before, I want to know, Dr. Field, in your philosophy, who is Jesus? Muslims, who is Jesus? Oprah, in your isms, uh, who is Jesus? What position th does he hold? Who do you say that Jesus is? Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? All of life revolves around that answer. Who is Jesus? Who is the Christ? Okay, what doctrine are you exploring? Say, well, I want to I wanna get with the woke crowd. I want to get with, the, I want to become a, a black Hebrew. I want to become a, a black Israelite. I want to become a five percenter. I want to know. I want to know. Before I join your group. Before I join your group. What position does Jesus hold? Who is he? Who is he? He says, here's how you know, I feel my help. Here's how you know that you're operating by the Spirit of God. Every spirit, I told you spirit, pneuma, doctrine, ideology. Every spirit, 
every doctrine no matter how complex no matter how sophisticated every doctrine that confesses that admits that it agrees to the point that 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 confess that Jesus Christ is coming the flesh is of God what are you talking about I'm glad you asked me oh my uh, praise the Lord you know we're having a Super Bowl right now. Look at this. Uh, look at this right here. Praise the Lord. Uh, you see, there was, there was a doctrine that was taught by Serenthus. Serenthus had a doctrine. It was called the Serenthian, not Corinthian. Serenthian. They were Gnostic teachers. And the uh, Serenthus taught that uh, when Jesus was born, Serenthus taught that Jesus was not divine. And that Jesus was not born of the Virgin Mary. Serenthus readily admits that Jesus was more righteous than any man. More godly than any man but that Jesus was not divine. Serenthus taught that when John baptized Jesus, that's when the divine came upon Jesus. When the Holy Ghost lit on his shoulder like a dove and the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased Serenthus taught that was when Jesus became divine. So that explains how he healed the sick, raised the dead, opened blinded eyes. And then Tom Serenthus said that when Jesus got on the cross, that the divine left him while he was on the cross. That the, the, the divine, that is, that part that made Jesus the Christ. That that part left him. That Christ left Jesus. And the only thing that was left on the cross was a mere human being. And therefore, that's how Jesus died. Because Serenthius uh, believed that God was too holy. Too mighty, too perfect to involve himself in the affairs of this earth. So that in the mind of Serenthius, Christ never died. But Jesus died. Yes, that's what he believed. He believed that Jesus, are y'all following me? That Jesus became the Christ. Not that he was born the Christ, but he grew up to be the son of God. Grew up to be the savior of the world. But I want you to know that Serenthius got it wrong. For I heard the apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, just one passage. He says, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died. Not, not just Jesus, but Christ, the Messiah, died for the ungodly. And then in verse 8 it says, uh, But God displayed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to know that Jesus was the Christ when he died. And uh, that Jesus was the Christ when he was born. Yes, For I heard him tell him when they told Mary, says now unto you, uh, told the wise man unto you, is born this day in the city of David, the Savior, Christ the Lord. He was Christ from day one. But, but you know, you know, he was more than Christ from day one. 
I, I can go back, I can go back, I can go back further than that. The Bible said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So Jesus was the Christ. The Bible said and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the Christ before there was a world. Before there was a planet, before there was a star, Jesus was the Christ, son of the living God. Can I get a witness? Mm, Bible teachers, even Jesus prayed himself in John 17 and 5. And now, O oh Father, glorify thy me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was before the planet existed. This is why you got to serve the Lord. This is why no human being is worth your relationship with God. Humans, you, I don't care if you're the prettiest woman in here, it won't last. Uh, it all fades. Praise the Lord. You can be the best looking man in here. That ain't going to last. It all fades. Everything drops over time. Drops, fall out. You name it. I told y'all before, they sell age defying cream nothing defies age you can slow it down but you can't defy it can't stop it but God is forever the Bible said Jesus Christ is same yesterday today and forevermore isn't it good to know that we serve a savior who's never passed his prime the athlete loses a step the boxer loses his quickness the politician loses his juice. Y'all don't hear me. The preacher loses his ability to preach. But Jesus never loses a step. He's just as powerful today as he was yesterday. Yeah! Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He said every spirit every doctrine that puts Jesus in his proper place is of God you can feel all right about it if it puts Jesus in his proper place he said but every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is the Christ that Jesus came in the flesh that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is not of God this is the spirit of anti Christ whereof I told you I've told you before and uh, even now what is interesting here is that it's already in the world I want to tell you the word world here is not planet but it's the world the cosmos the doctrine of Antichrist is everywhere it's in the world system it's in the world order it's in government it's in entertainment it's in media you find it in education sports and religion you find it in the print media they're trying to tell you that you don't have to be saved that you don't have to serve the Lord that there is another way but I'm here to tell you that that's the spirit of Antichrist don't fall for it don't fall for it Jesus he stacked the deck against him against himself he got the disciples and he went to Caesarea Philippi and he stood in a place where the backdrop was shining glistening glowing false gods the gods of the world houses lit up on the sides of the hill that reflected paganism and false gods it was in that background with that context in that backdrop Jesus said who do you say that I am I heard Peter say I'm not being fooled by the shiny objects I'm not fooled by the glitz and glitter of the world thou art the Christ Son of the living God. Yeah! 
Yes, Lord. I wonder today how many here will say, Preacher, I'm not fooled. Thank you, Jesus. The world can have that glitter. They can have that noise. They can have that sound. But I know who Jesus is. I know that I've been born again. I know that I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Yeah, yeah. If you know, let me hear you praise him. If you know. Thank you, Jesus. I know he's real. I know he's real. He said the world has its lights, has its glitter. He said, but I'm here. These antichrists, they'll teach you against me. But then he gave them, gave them good news. He said, you are of God. Now right there, a big praise belong right there. You are of God. If you're of God, give the Lord a praise right there. I'm of God. I'm of God. I'm of God. Tell your name, I'm of God. I'm of the Lord. I'm saved. I'm on the Lord's side. I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm of God. And he told them, you're of God, little children, and have overcome them. Why did he say this? Well, in the Roman temple, there was a statue of the goddess Nike. Nike was the goddess that she is of victory, a winged creature that was erected in the temple of Dementin. And in that temple in Ephesus, that winged creature was lifted up to show everybody that they were under the domination of the Romans. So when you looked up and they saw that statue, that statue said that Nike is God. But I heard John say, don't be intimidated by that statue because you have, you are of the true God and you've overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The world can put up his statues. The world can make a grand display, but the greater one is living on the inside of me. I've got power on the inside. I've got joy on the inside. I've got the love of Jesus on the inside. And somebody ought to shout, greater, greater, greater. It's he that is in me than he that is in the world. I've got more power than the devil has. I've got more power than the world has. I've got more power than my opponents have for greater your hands and praise the Lord for having the greater one the greater one the greater the world knows how to flex its muscles I'll never forget one year one day I was in at Fedver State and the Christian community had gone on a trip. I couldn't go because I was on the football team. And uh, they had a party on campus. 
And all my Christian friends were gone. I was sitting there at the then Williams Hall. You remember Williams Hall? Williams Hall. Sitting out there on the picnic table. Oh, Lord. And uh, across the way at Williams Hall, I could hear, thank you, Jesus, the party going on just on the other side of the fence. I had the girls laughing. Good God Almighty, music blasting. And all my friends were gone, and I was sitting there by myself. And uh, it sounds so good. Oh, Lord. Something told me you ought to go over there and join the party. Oh, Lord. Then uh, the Lord spoke to me. God didn't tell me not to go. He just came up to me and uh, he said, Patrick, do you remember how it was when you were in the world? Yeah. Do you remember what it was like then? I told God, yes. He said, well, ain't nothing changed. It's the same old, same old. If you want that, go for it. But if you want me, stay where you are. I'm so glad. Oh, oh I'm glad. Do I have anybody glad today? I'm so glad that I stayed with the Lord. Good God Almighty, I've got joy. I've got peace, I've got power, I'm on my way to heaven, he's been good to me, thank you, thank you Lord, for power to conquer the world, power to overcome, power. And they overcame him by the word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. God has given us not only power, but he's given us the wherewithal we need to test competing doctrines and ideologies to weigh them against the truth. What is the standard? What is the measure? Who is the standard? Who do you weigh all truth? Who do you compare it to? The answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the king. And I'll tell you, I don't care what you're facing. I'm not going to pray for you today that the Lord gives you power to face and to overcome life's challenges. For John didn't pray that prayer. John just reminded them of what they already had. Greater. Is he that is in you than he that is in the world. My question to you is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Preacher, pray for me that God would strengthen me. I have the power. You've made that argument. But pray for me that God would strengthen me. Pray for me that I be a better soldier for the Lord. Pray for me that I resist the pull and the tug of this world. The Bible says, the world passeth away. 
as we've, we've seen of late, sometimes it comes sudden, unexpected. And no matter what the world says, the world doesn't have the authority to set up new criteria for salvation. Either you get saved according to the scriptures or you're not saved at all. The altar is open. Come down. Man of God, pray my strength in the Lord. Preacher, pray. Pray for me that I stand in the strength of the Almighty. Come. We're waiting for you.